like to head back to participate in that. Jamie? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for Gary, the lesson he's going to bring today. We pray that you open our ears and hearts. Let us take it in our souls and follow it this week. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Good morning, church. So, as Brandon was talking about people putting up their Christmas decorations... Uh, I know a lot of you have done that, uh, maybe some of you are Scrooges and don't do that, but uh, it, it's okay if, if you do, it's okay if you don't. Uh, a lot of them uh, went up around Halloween, it seems like it gets earlier every year. Uh, some people leave them up all year long. So wherever you are in all of that, uh, I, I, I want to encourage you right off the bat uh, a, a couple of things. One is most people's lives, whether they claim to be Christians or not, when this time of the year comes, they start focusing then on a birth of a Savior. Sometimes we have people living around us who are culturally Christian. You understand what I mean by that? They don't really attend. They don't go anywhere. They don't identify with a certain church or a group of people. But if you ask them, they say, yeah, we're, we're a Christian. And you wonder, well, are they, uh, you know, who, who are we to judge? But nevertheless, people's thoughts this time of the year go to a little town in Bethlehem and they start thinking about Christianity a little bit, mainly the birth of a Savior more than anything. And so with that, with that being said, listen to me. It, you know, it's a good time to invite your neighbors to come to worship. Anytime's a good time. But when people's minds are starting to think this way, go ahead and invite them. All they can do is say no. They might be ugly in saying it, but that's on them. You invited them. But let me tell you this, too. One thing, and it's a rather innocuous thing, is, and it's easy to do, is... We have our Christmas Eve candlelight service coming up. Did y'all know that? Yeah. Y'all know when that is? Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Just wondering if y'all knew when that. Well, we didn't know when it was. <laughs> okay. I can't help you. But uh, the 24th, yes, Christmas Eve, Saturday evening here at 5 o'clock. And it will last no more than an hour. Come as you are. We'd love to have you uh, come and be a part of our candlelight service. An easy way to invite someone to worship. Get them here and see that, you know, we're some pretty good folks. Speaking of folks, we have a lot of our folks <laughs> that are gone. I appreciate our guests today. Thank you for coming and filling a few pews because we have a lot of our people that, that, are, that are not here today. But uh, we invite all of your guests included, come and be with us anytime, especially with our candlelight service coming up. So, I am going to do a, a series leading up to Christmas and uh, the holiday season, all of that, with everything going on. And uh, we're, we're going to uh, look at the heart of Christmas and, and reflect a little bit on the birth of our Lord and Savior and what that truly means to all of us. And not to get caught, so caught up in all of the stuff going on around this time of the year, the busyness of our lives. And it can get so busy, so fast, with everything going on, we don't think about the heart of Christmas. I want us to do that, not only today, not only during this series, but throughout this whole month. So this morning, we're going to discover the first lesson in our series about hope, the hope that comes to us through the birth of Jesus Christ. And I'm sure we could all use a little hope 
this Christmas season. This Christmas season. So with that, we'll have a video. So we can, we can learn a lot about having hope, not only by reading our scriptures, but you know, as I, as I was thinking about this, we can learn a lot about having hope through the holiday season by watching children embrace the holiday season. I know as a child growing up, it was the greatest time of the year, looking forward to Christmas. Do you remember the Sears toy catalog that came out, I devoured that thing. I would mark it all up. Did y'all ever do that? I mean, that, I hate to say, became my Bible for the month of December. It was absolutely amazing. But nothing says hope like the list that children create for Christmas. It's always one of my favorite things to do, to write that list, to get it going, all the different things that I wanted. And finally, I would, I would be talking to my parents, and we'd be looking at the Sears catalog, the Christmas catalog, and I'd say, I want this and this, and, that, and everything on this page, and everything on this page, and it would go right on. And uh, yeah, I didn't get everything, uh, naturally. But it was, it was leading up to the hope, the hope, the hope that you had leading up to Christmas. I think the true reason there's hope at the heart of Christmas isn't because of gifts, but church, it's because of the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. His arrival on this earth was the fulfillment of a prophecy spoken hundreds of years before his birth. That prophecy is actually one of the most well-known scripture passages shared during this time of the year, and that's where we're going to begin our journey today. In Isaiah chapter 9, starting at verse 2, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those, on those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle with every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us... A child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty 
will accomplish this. So, what was leading up to Isaiah to write these things? Well, pretty much, it was poor leadership. You remember the story of Israel over and over again where, where they would mess up, cry out to God. God would come to their rescue. They'd go by, things would be fine, and then they'd mess up. I mean, and when I say mess up, I mean gradually starting to get worse and worse. All kinds of bad things. And they'd be taken into captivity or whatever. Cry out to God. God will come to the rescue. Y'all know the story, right? You know the cycle. I think that same cycle happens to us, actually, as individuals and quite honestly as a nation. But here they are. They're crying out to God. Poor leadership. Yeah. The people of Israel have been suffering through the reigns of four very ungodly kings, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. They were corrupt. They led the people far from God in a very dark time in their history. And Isaiah wrote these words knowing God would have to intervene to bring Israel back to himself. Kingdom was crumbling, and these folks here, they needed some hope. This passage here from Isaiah chapter 9 makes two major statements. The first is an acknowledgement of the brokenness and darkness that surrounded Israel due to sin and corruption. The second is the hope here of a dawning light through the birth of a child. The birth of a child who would one day make things right. The Jewish people here in the Old Testament needed these words to remind them God had not forgotten them. So the book of Matthew also reminds us of Isaiah's writings. The gospel writer here was making the connection between what Isaiah had uh, had written and what had taken place in a manger. Let's look at Matthew um, chapter 1, 22-23. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. A young Jewish man named Joseph was presented with a pretty bad decision here, a very difficult decision to make, engaged to be married to to a woman named Mary, And she was a hot mess, young and pregnant, and he knew he had not touched her. Y'all remember our series on hot messes, right? (laughs) You just have to think about that a little bit. Young girl, here's Joseph. Loves her, doesn't know what to do. She comes, oh, by the way, yeah, I'm with child. But it was an angel. And he's like, okay. Yeah. Joseph planned to call the wedding off because it appeared she'd been unfaithful. But then an angel of the Lord spoke to Joseph in a dream and told him to go forward with the marriage because the baby in her womb was from the Holy Spirit. All of these events took place to fulfill the prophecy from the Hebrew Bible, which claimed there would be a child born as a light in the darkness and a hope for everyone. The child would be named Emmanuel means God with us, even in the midst of darkness, even through walking through the valley, the shadow of death, God is with us. So the center of the Christmas story is focused entirely on the birth of Christ, the fulfillment of the Israelites' hope that God would push back the darkness 
and bring a bright light into the world. They had hope. They finally had hope. We got hope. And one of the reasons Christmas resonates in our hearts is because we do live in a world that's very similar to Israel. Our world is dark and often corrupt because of the sin that that so easily entangles. Sin that is all around us that we're being told that isn't sin. It's okay. It's okay. There's war, disease, conflict, oppression everywhere. And we're in need of the Christ child to usher in a light, to push back the darkness, to remind us of the hope, the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. I, 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 I don't know, I don't know if, 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 if losing one's hope is, is like the worst thing that could happen to them. To always have hope. If you lose your hope, then where are you? Listen, church, our hope is in Jesus Christ. Our faith is in Jesus Christ. And Christmas is a reminder that whatever it is that we hope for in our lives, whether it's healing, restoration, forgiveness, fresh start, it's available to us through Emmanuel, God with us. A reminder that hope is not a result of, of the absence of conflict or difficulty or attitude or struggle or trial. Hope is the result of the presence of God. Having that hope. You know, the hard part about hope is that it often takes longer than we'd like. Did you realize, do you realize that? When we have hope for something, we, we, you know, we hope, maybe we pray for it too. Because we should pray for those things. And then we have that hope. But it can take a while. Remember Israel? Looking back to them. It didn't happen overnight. It took years. Decades. Centuries. Having that hope. Even when we want it fulfilled right away. Lord, I'm impatient. Praying for the patience, and you want it now. Because I want to have hope, but I want to have that hope, and I, I, I want it fulfilled now, Lord. Now. There's a common plant. Y'all familiar with this plant? Y'all know the name of this plant? Century plant, right. These were very common when we lived in uh, Arizona, but they're also here. Do some of you have this plant? Yeah, they're they're, they're here. Uh, Just to show you how smart I am, it's also called the Agave Americana. Y'all like that I'm that smart, I know. And you figure I looked it up, and I did. Known as the century plant. It grows with displayed leaves that, 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 that they can grow to be a foot wide. This plant can reach 12 feet in diameter and grow to be 6 feet tall. But perhaps its most unusual trait is that its long reproduction cycle. It has a long reproduction cycle. You see, for 20 to 30 years, this plant remains the same height and puts out no flowers whatsoever. For 20 to 30 years, it just kind of sits there and sucks up all your water. And then suddenly, and without warning, a new bud will sprout. Kind of resembles a tree trunk-sized asparagus spear all of a sudden that happens after 20 30 years and it will rise into the sky 
at a rate of 7 inches per day until it reaches a height of 20 to 40 feet. Then it culminates with a crown of several clumps of yellow blossoms that last for about three weeks. It's pretty amazing to me. Similar to the century plant, some of the greatest answers to our hoping and longing take time. They take time and it takes patience to see the beauty unfold. Isaiah saw that one day in the future, God would bring a great light and salvation through the birth of a child. But it wasn't until hundreds of years later, Matthew recounted Jesus' birth or recorded Jesus' birth in, in Bethlehem. Jesus, Jesus hears the very presence of God on earth. He offers forgiveness of sins, destruction of evil, and the promise of eternal life. So why do we read Isaiah's prophecy every year dur during this time, this Christmas time? Why do people who aren't even faithful, who, who, who are culturally Christian, why are, they, why, why, why are they familiar with this, with this verse, with this narrative here in, in Isaiah? Well, we do read it a lot, and we bring it to people's attention. That the prophecy is real. And then Matthew says, hey, it's real. This has happened. Hope is here. Hope has arrived. Jesus is here. You see, seeing the faithfulness of God in the past gives us a hope in the present. It gives us not only hope for the present, but trust for the future. The Apostle Paul made an appeal for hope to those who trust in Christ. When he wrote a letter to the early church in Rome, Romans 15, 4, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the Scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Lose your hope, and I think you've lost everything. Having hope. Paul said everything that had been written in the past was meant to teach us. What has been written gives us endurance and encouragement that we might have hope. It's important that we revisit the prophetic words of the Old Testament and the fulfillment of the prophecy that comes through the birth of Jesus because it reminds us that God can be trusted to come through and meet our greatest time of need. Now, we don't always like God's timing. I'm sorry, I just spoke for all of us. I personally do not always like His timing. But I have to trust His timing. And I have to have hope in His timing. Though there are many distractions during the Christmas season... This is a reminder that hope is offered to us through Jesus' arrival so many years ago in a manger in Bethlehem. Dr. James Dobson tells a story of an elderly woman named Stella Thornhope. Stella was struggling because this was her first Christmas alone. Her husband had died just a few months prior through a slow-developing cancer. Several days before Christmas, she was almost snowed in by a brutal weather system. She felt terribly alone. So much so, she decided, well, I'm not going to decorate for Christmas this year. Late that afternoon, the doorbell rang. There was a delivery boy with a box. He said, Mrs. Thornhope, would you please sign here? She invited him to step inside and close the door to get away from the cold. She signed the paper and said, well, what's in the box? Young man laughed and opened up the flap. And inside the box 
with a little golden Labrador retriever. He picked up the squirming pup and he explained, this is for you, ma'am. He is six weeks old and completely housebroken. I think that's a lie in <laughs> Dr. Dobson's relation to this story. There's no way you've got a lab that's completely housebroken in six weeks. I don't know if the lab could ever be totally housebroken. But he tells the story of Mrs. Stella Thornhope. Young puppy began to wiggle in happiness at being released from captivity. Who sent this, Mrs. Thornhope asked. Young man set the animal down and handed her an envelope and said, It's all explained here in this envelope, ma'am. The dog was bought last July while its mother was still pregnant. This was meant to be a Christmas gift to you. The young man then handed her a book, How to Care for your Labrador Retriever. At which the lab probably promptly ate the book. If you've ever been around labs. In desperation, she again asked, Who sent me this puppy? As the young man turned to leave, he said, Your husband, ma'am. Merry Christmas. She opened the letter from her husband. He'd written it three weeks before he died. He left it with the kennel owners to be delivered with the puppy as his last Christmas gift to her. The letter was full of love and encouragement and admonishments to be strong. He vowed he was waiting for the day when she had joined him in heaven. He'd sent her this young animal to keep her company until then. She wiped away the tears. She put the letter down and then remembered the puppy at her feet. She picked up the golden furry ball and she held it to her neck. She looked out the window at the lights that outlined the neighbor's house. And she heard from the radio in the kitchen the strains of joy to the world. The Lord has come. Suddenly, Stella felt the most amazing sensation of hope washing over her. Her heart felt a joy and a wonder greater than the grief and the loneliness. Little fella, she said to the little dog, it's just you and me. But you know what? There's a box down in the basement, I bet, that you'd like. It's got a little Christmas tree in it and some decorations. And she said, it's got some lights that are going to impress you. And there's a manger scene down there. Let's go get it. You see, our God is always on time. He knows exactly what we need. He can be trusted in the light of Christ to push back the darkness that so often pervades our life. A land full of deep darkness, a light has indeed dawned. Church, I want to encourage you this morning. You see, th there's darkness around us. And in some of you right now, there might be a darkness going on that only you know about, only you can touch, only you can feel, and it is so heavy on your heart. You might not express that to anyone. It might be so deep and so personal You can't talk to anyone. So a couple of things. Jesus gives us hope. And there is hope. There is a hope for no matter what darkness might be going on in your life, no matter what evil, no matter what is going on, there is still 
hope because we have that hope. Jesus came. He gave us hope. So I'm going to close this morning with this. To our members, to our guests, thank you for being here. If there's things in your life if you don't feel like you have that hope, it may be if you've lost hope, I would love to talk with you more about that. Our elders, would, we're here for you. I promise that. I promise you I am here for you. You have our phone numbers. You have our email. I tell you every week, call me. Call me. Text me. Email me. If it's important, very important, urgent, call me. If you feel like you're losing hope, if you feel like you're at the end of a rope and you don't know where to go, you know what? We have hope. But I also live in a real world that I know that even though I can tell you we have that hope and I can show you scriptures and I can show you promises of God that have been fulfilled and all of that stuff, sometimes we still have a difficult time understanding how that applies to us in our lives when we're going through what feels like a hopeless situation. Church, there is hope. And the hope is in Jesus Christ. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. But I also, once again, know sometimes we need maybe practical ways of dealing with what feels like our hopeless situation. I hope you'll call me. That's my hope. I hope you'll reach out to me if there's something you need, something we can do. And we're here for you. Our Lord is here for you. Church, we're going to have an invitation song. If you need to come to the Lord, you're welcome to come and respond publicly this morning. If you would like to just get with me afterwards or one of our elders afterwards, that's fine too. If you need prayers, we'll be willing. We're more than happy to pray with you. Uh, we're, we'll do anything we can to help you, publicly or privately. That's up to you. This morning, if you have need of the hope of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we invite you to come right now while together we stand and while we sing.